Welcome to Airway Breathing Conversation, a podcast presented by the anesthesiology residents at the University of Saskatchewan, created to provide individuals of all levels of medical knowledge with anesthesiology-related healthcare information. This episode is part of our abridged Grand Round series in which highly knowledgeable and sought-after guest speakers present on a multitude of fascinating topics relevant to anesthesia. Join us for Grand Rounds this week, where Dr. Jordan Leach, an anesthesiologist and intensivist in Kingston, Ontario, discusses the role of MINS and BNP in the perioperative setting. Now, whether you are an anesthesiologist, resident, medical student, or member of the general public, come listen in as we demystify the incredible specialty that is anesthesiology, one episode at a time. Welcome, everybody. Um, and so we'll just get right into it. And I'm happy to take questions along the way. There's lots of space at the end for questions, too. And as Eugene said, I really do hope to make this um, a practical talk. Um, but I think that background plays a lot into it. So I will go into that as well. Um, and as titled, MINS BNP WTF. Um, so I don't have any disclosures because I am early career and passionate yet unfunded, uh, mostly. <laughs> um, but I do have some acknowledgments and um, my um, my colleague, Dr. Joel Parlow, is one of my, um, you know, academic and research mentors. And we actually delivered this talk together at CAS. Um, and um, he is um, is traveling uh, now. He may, may or may not be on this rounds listening in, um, but always thank you to him for all the guidance. Um, to Eugene, thanks for recommending me. And Henry made the whole process really lovely. And I'm just so impressed with the airway breathing and conversation forum and podcast and uh, YouTube channel. And just what a great initiative. It's so innovative. I, I hope that um, um, I can talk with Eugene and the other PDs and we can continue to grow it even more because I think it's a really fantastic thing you guys are doing. Um, so I'll have some poll everywhere uh, mixed into this, just a couple um, to kind of touch in and see where everyone's at with the topic. Um, I'm going to go over the story of MINS, myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery, because I do think that it really puts into context why you should care at all about what I'm saying today. Um, we're going to do a perioperative guideline comparison between major continents um, and, and guideline um, expert groups. Um, we'll talk about practical evidence-based MINS management because, yes, there are definitely things that are easy to do and have good evidence for. And then um, at the end, I'll give a practical approach to improving um, perioperative risk stratification at your center. Um, and this talk is mostly what I did at CAS, although um, I got a lot of great feedback and lots of people reaching out about um, specific questions. Uh, and I've added that as well to this talk um, to hopefully make it even more useful for everyone. So I'd like to like paint a picture of two patients. Um, and our first one is uh, the, the fit, um, you know, elderly person who is coming for a bilateral um, knee replacement, which in our center we admit for, um, and uh, it is great, non-smoker, tries to be active, wants to get their knees done so they can get back to uh, chasing their grandkids around. And, and you know, one of these like end of bed test is like they are going to soar after surgery. And your other patient is your, your classic vasculopath patient. They're coming for a fempop. They're going to be um, admitted for a couple of days at least after surgery. They've got all of the cardiac risk factors. They smoke, they drink, um, they they have cardiac disease or they've had a stroke. They've, they've got it all. And your end of bed test on them is bad. You know, this is the patient that you think is very likely going to um, end up with complications postoperatively. So perioperative medicine is the area in general that I care about. And I think that we all care about because we're all here listening to this talk. And I think we do a fantastic job intraoperatively. We know that intraoperative morbidity, mortality is exceedingly low thanks to technological advances and really a lot of focus of our group uh, of anesthesiologists, as well as our fastidiousness in caring for patients in a one-on-one -on -one fashion. We got a lot better in the preoperative phase. We know the importance of optimization. We know the importance of seeing complex patients in clinic to get all the right things teed up, to give us the time we need. But really, the postoperative phase, we've kind of just forgotten about. 
uh, for, uh, for many reasons, um, time constraints, um, you know, just more patients, more lists, another, another, uh, another thing to do the next day that prevents us from seeing our patients, um, caring for our patients postoperatively and an extremely busy surgical service for the most part that is not really able to adequately care for the, the degree uh, and the plethora of medical conditions and medical complications that our postoperative patients see. And really it's very much a see you later alligator kind of situation after we send someone to the recovery room. There's over 300 million major surgeries performed around the world. And when you look at the, the complications after these surgeries, I actually think it's something to pause and think about because we don't really. And I think that's a feature of this see you later alligator post-op thing that we do as anesthesiologists where we think did our work, got them through the surgery, now on to the next one. Because we actually see about 8 million deaths per year uh, around the world after major surgery. And in fact, perioperative mortality within 30 days of surgery is the third leading cause of death worldwide after um, strokes and ischemic heart disease. So that's a big deal. Um, we also know that we have 15% of all of our patients who have serious postoperative morbidity requiring intervention. Um, and then there's an additional 15% 30-day readmission rate. These numbers absolutely dwarf issues that occur intraoperatively. Um, and we'll get into the, into the data for that in a second here. Um, so there's so many patients. So can we even help everyone? That's pretty debatable. If we can't help everyone, how can we figure out who needs our help? Who's the most at risk? And then if we can identify the people most at risk, is there anything we can actually do for them? Because what's the point of identifying these people if there's nothing that you can do for them? And, and spoiler alert, that's been one of the main criticisms of all of the men's literature and men's policy is what are we even doing for these patients? And I really hope to show you by the end of this talk that there's lots that we can and should be doing for these patients. Who has non-cardiac surgery, NCS? Everybody. Um, a U.S. database study shows us that um, there are over 10 million citizens in the U.S., of course, over 45, pretty young, who 50% of whom have multiple coronary risk factors um, and 25% of whom who have known atherosclerotic disease. And that matters because we know how implicated coronary artery disease and um, cardiovascular risk factors are implicated um, in postoperative risk and postoperative morbidity and mortality. This is not a new concept by any means. And in fact, um, this is a, a quote from a, a very famous anesthesiologist that anyone who studied for the Royal College exam, uh, JAF, will get some like slight, slight triggers from. Um, and uh, and this group mentioned in a JAMA article that the diagnosis of coronary artery occlusion, so um, MIs essentially, uh, following surgery is very difficult because usually you have crushing chest pain, heavy chest pain um, that you associate with this, but it's often blunted or completely absent in a huge number, up to 50% of cases because of the anesthetic, the opioids, and those types of things. So we know this, we've known this. We've known this for a long time. This is a 1938 article that these three fellows wrote. Um, so we've known how hard it is to figure out what's going on with patients postoperatively for a long time. And, and we've not really made much gain in what to do with it uh, until relatively recently. So the story of bins. So for anyone who needs to be orientated to it, um, and, and apologies if, if it's too basic, just get everyone on the same page. So this is defined by um, a rise in cardiac biomarkers, so troponins, um, to uh, a level that's above normal um, of your normal reference values, which not explained by another cause, um, for instance, sepsis or atrial fibrillation, things like that, um, and occurs within 30 days of your non-cardiac surgery. And it can or it cannot have any ischemic signs or symptoms. And we think that about, from, from um, various uh, studies, we think that about 20 to 30% of men, so this troponin elevation comes from actual atherosclerotic plaque disruption, coronary syndromes, and about 70 to 80% comes from just type 2 supply demand mismatch, um, which I think is fairly intuitive. It, it makes sense. Surgery is a stressful thing. You're going to have a stress response. We know that um, 
you know, again, we know that postoperative tachycardia is one of the highest risk factors for postoperative um, uh, coronary issues and um, troponin rises. And so that makes sense that we're seeing, we're seeing these numbers. But really, no one had put all of this together in a cohesive way until the vision group. And the vascular events and non-cardiac surgery patient cohort evaluation studied 40,000 patients um, prospectively. And they sought out to answer these four guiding questions. And I think this is important because this is where so, so much of our literature and our knowledge comes from. And they really shone a light on us. Uh, on this issue of um, of myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery. So first of all, they want to know just what is the incidence of mortality in MACE, which is major adverse cardiac events after non-cardiac surgery. They want to know what is the best way to actually predict who's going to have MACE and mortality. They want to know what proportion of patients who have an MI would actually be completely missed without routine monitoring, like with troponin. And they also want to know, what is this relationship between postoperative troponin values and, and vascular death? And that means, is there some kind of a, a linear relationship between the higher the trope, uh, the higher the risk of um, MACE and death? And to, for, for clarity, major adverse cardiac events, you're talking about mortality, non-fatal stroke, non-fatal cardiac arrest, and non-fatal heart failure. Um, in this particular group. Uh, there's various definitions depending on the guidelines, depending on the papers that you're reading. So this is answering your main outcomes questions. A busy slide, lots going on here. I really think you can boil it down to kind of a few simple, um, a few simple conclusions. So looking at these 40,000 patients, they found an average of a 1.8% 30-day 30, 30 mortality. When I first learned this number, I felt like that was really high. These are all comers. Um, these are not just your high risk group. And of course, this is a study done around the world. So in North America, we tend to have a 1.1% 30-day mortality. And when you compare that to Africa, they're having um, the 6.4% 30-day mortality. Um, so their numbers are far lower or, or far higher, um, but their number of recruitment was far lower. So they don't, they're not dragging that up as much as... Uh, as much as you think, just by how different the, the percentage points that are. 70% um, of these deaths are occurring during the post-operative hospital admission. That, that's called the index hospital admission. So right after you have your surgery and you get admitted, 70% of the deaths are occurring there. The next 28% of the deaths are occurring at home within that 30 days of surgery. And less than 1% of this are occurring, far less than 1% are occurring actually intraoperatively. So that is the impetus for this focus on the post-operative hospital admission and the post-operative care, because that's the money shot. That's where things are going down. Looking at a division by type of surgery, general surgery tends to tends to have the higher 30-day um, mortalities, um, vascular surgery and neurosurgery. I think it's relatively intuitive. These are larger, more complex surgeries. And across the board in these types, when you compare it to, say, for instance, like a cardiac surgery, these are surgeries where you're not really dealing with the cardiovascular risk factors in the surgery. You're dealing with a cancer. You're dealing with a spinal cord or a tumor. You're dealing with some other issue. You're not actually addressing the coronary artery disease like you are in heart, in cardiac surgery. And that's why we look at these patients in separate groups um, because the risk is, is just so much higher. Um, and then this final box here is talking about um, the attributable fraction. So that means how much of this um, entity, whether it's major bleeding, MINS, or sepsis, contributes to mortality in patients. And what we see is that MINS, major bleeding, and sepsis have very, very similar attributable fractions to mortality. And that means that if you have a troponin elevation after surgery, or you have sepsis after surgery, you have an equal likelihood of dying after surgery. And that's how much this MINS is meaning. It's an independent risk factor marking MACE and mortality. So your next question is, um, what's the best clinical model? This I would say is fairly widely known. It's your revised cardiac risk index. Um, and what is perhaps a little bit less known uh, is that the 1999 um, 
uh, cardiac risk index that was generated actually has been uh, reanalyzed in the context of these vision numbers, just because the numbers are so high, 40,000 patients, so powerful. And what we actually found is those previous, the, the cardiac risk index really underestimated the baseline risk um, to all patients. Um, and this revised cardiac risk index certainly uh, increases the risk estimate um, for each point value. Um, and so this is a little bit more known. And this these numbers were reanalyzed with the vision data. Now we get into some MIN stuff. So this is looking at prospectively a specific specific section of about 15,000 patients who underwent non-cardiac surgery and looking at their 30-day outcomes. And what we looked at, what not we, what vision looked at was um, patients who suffered MINs, so a troponin elevation after surgery, and patients who did not suffer MINs, so did not suffer troponin elevation after surgery. Unsurprisingly, vast number of patients did not have a troponin elevation after surgery, over 13,000. But over 1,000 did. And that's where it becomes really interesting. So about 8% of patients had, had the troponin elevation. 84% of these patients who had troponin elevation were completely asymptomatic. It was only picked up because we, they were monitoring the troponins in the context of this study which I think as you can see already from what I said, really matters because we know how, what a good independent risk factor troponin elevation is after surgery for serious events that patients care about like dying and having heart attacks. So the other thing you wanna notice is that these patients who suffered from troponin elevation or suffered from MINS, their risk of all of these things went way up. And again, this is a prospective study looking at these patients. So the risk of, um, and specifically kind of draw your eye to the, uh, your risk of mortality goes from 1.1% to 9.8% if you suffer MINS. It's a big deal. And your risk of your, all of your major events, so this is your MACE, your MACE section, goes from about 2% to about 18% if you do suffer MINS. So that's what drove a lot of this fuss about MINS is that, it seems like these people who are having troponin elevations are going on to have bad things happen to them. And as, as you may or may not have already surmised, it actually does not matter if someone has a troponin elevation and they do or they do not have cardiac symptoms. It is irrelevant to the risk that is, that is um, brought to them simply by having the troponin elevation in the first place. So, you know, the question comes like, should you monitor these perioperative proponents? And I mean, obviously some of us are are already believers. Some of us are not believers. Um, but what vision, which is a study I've been talking about and what another study from a, from a similar group did poise showed us is that you are going to miss both MINS and MACE, which remember is mortality and MI if you do not monitor troponin. So, so we do know that. And this is kind of a little flow chart just to help you think about the, the MIN study that kind of changed the way we think about everything. So you took 15,000 patients and 8% of them had MINs and 92% didn't. And the 8% that had MINs had a 10 times complication rate than the ones that did not have MINs. And that's really, your, that's really what this whole talk is about. If you don't follow your troponins postoperatively, you're going to miss 90% of the MINs, the troponin elevations that we know are an independent risk factor for bad things to come. And you're going to miss 50% of MIs. The fourth question of vision is looking at your troponin thresholds. So that was like, is there a correlation between how high the troponin goes and how bad the outcomes are going to be? And not super surprisingly, yeah, the higher the troponin, the higher the 30-day mortality. So which one do you use, BNP or NT pro BNP? If you've read the guidelines, you'll see you have like both options. Um, but our answer is use whichever test is available at your center. We're working on getting this published. This was a little study that we did here at KHSC, um, which is in Kingston, um, to work on a conversion formula and eventually a conversion table um, so that no matter which test you have at your center, you'll be able to use the most updated guidelines and take best care of your patient. So looking beyond vision a little bit, um, you know, 
what are other groups doing? Because I think that matters. You know, this isn't just one group uh, that's really, really invested. It has been interest in men's has been steadily growing since vision and other groups have uh, corroborated other really interesting things. Um, the Swiss study looked really, really far out. So patients who had men's after surgery, they followed them um, for a long time, um, in fact, a year. And what they found was that if you had men's, you not only had a higher risk of having um, your mace uh, complications in the 30 days after surgery, this risk was maintained up until a year out, multiple years out we've seen in other studies. And there's lots of ways of interpreting that. Um, and it's not to say that just because you have men's, you are therefore going to have a bad complication um, at one year out. But what we are seeing is that men's is this indication of risk for something to come. And it gives us this extra window into the vulnerability or the um, attributable risk of a patient and maybe gives us an opportunity to intervene in that patient at that time before something bad actually does happen. This is a systematic review done of all the studies on MINS. So there's been 169 studies done on over 500,000 patients. Um, and again, it really corroborates what that Swiss study showed in their one cohort, which, which is that this risk to mortality if you suffer MINS is actually maintained at the one year mark. So you see kind of the familiar 30 day mortality mark where you have about the 10% increase in risk of mortality if you have MINS versus if you don't. But at the one year mark, you still have a four times risk of mortality um, compared to patients who did not suffer MINS after their surgery, which is really giving us this, this signal to um, fundamental risk factors that these patients um, are exhibiting simply by having an elevated troponin. But what's the value of your preoperative cardiac, cardiovascular risk assessment in the first place? And, and I would say there's lots of value um, to it beyond just filling out the anesthetic record for the person who ends up doing the surgery uh, or yourself. You know, is the surgery even appropriate? Goals of care discussions. What's the best surgical approach? Often now with, re with, with regional just blooming in popularity and, and skill, we can do this different ways without a general anesthetic would say that there's not really a great signal to um, to any impacts on MINS between general anesthesia and, and uh, neuraxial or regional anesthesia, but that's a separate topic. Um, how you're gonna do the anesthetic, um, where they're gonna go afterwards, how you're gonna monitor them, and just a shared care model. And what I really feel like we often offer as anesthesiologists is truly informed consent for our patients. We come in with a bird's eye view, bringing a lot of um, ideas and concepts together and uh, we're unbiased. You know, We come in and we can say like, I see a lot of people have the surgery. This is what your risk looks like. Um, I think we can get you through it safely, but this is what the next 30 days, the next six months, the next year could look like if you, if you undergo this surgery and you should know that. And I think people deserve to know that and we should trust that our patients deserve to know that. So risk prediction isn't new at all. Clinical gestalt, old as, you know, Osler, whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, metabolic equivalence. Uh, I think we're all pretty familiar with like, can you get up two flights of stairs? Can you walk two city blocks line that we uh, give to patients? RCRI, really useful, simple score, well validated um, in terms of clinical predictions. Um, and then biochemical markers, which is obviously uh, one of the points of, of, that I'd like to make um, to, to hopefully make your lives a little bit easier. So from the MET study, what we saw was that actually we are horrendous at accurately assessing exercise tolerance by using any of the questions that we usually ask. Um, so we are at around 19% sensitivity to determine someone who is actually able to get higher than uh, greater than four metabolic equivalents on true cardiopulmonary exercise testing. That is, that's not great. We are very good at identifying um, someone who is less than four, which is also a good, a good thing to be. I think that our, our gestalt is tuned into that. Um, and I think that really highlights what MINS and BNP have to offer us. We are really good at figuring out who is for sure going to have trouble. We are not so good at figuring out who might have trouble, who looks good on the surface. 
Um, so the Duke Activity Status Index is another one um, that, that's listed here on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, it's more involved. There's more questions. Um, you, you have to like delve in a little bit more, but also they're kind of more specific questions. And other than having to ask like older people if they're having sexual relations, I really like the questions on Dassey a lot better. It's easy to have a conversation around. Don't love asking them about sex though, but that's part of Dassey. Um, and, uh, and the metabolic equivalence is just, unfortunately, just not really useful. Um, don't need to remember any of this by any means. Go to MD Calc. Uh, it's super handy. It's in an app. I'm sure most of you use it. If you don't strongly recommend getting it for these risk scores, um, like DASI, RCRI, you know, as well as things like calculating your Chad's Vast 2 and, um, and your Ariscat scores. These are other you know, throm thrombosis and risk scores and everything. It's just, you don't need to remember it anymore. Just well put it in empty calc. And um, Dr. Uh, Winjust DeSera um, did this great study um, on the Duke Activity Status Index and found that actually if you scored less than 34, which I've given you an example here of someone scoring 24 points and kind of what that looks like, Scoring less than 34, this does um, positively and well correlate with um, the risk of MI, MINS, complications, and new disability. So DASI, useful, METS, not really, unfortunately. This is just a little plug again for MD Calc, just to save any of the guesswork of everything, um, because it tells you your risk. It easily informs your discussion with your patients, um, and it tells you the source, which is always nice. So now we get into these cardiac biomarkers, uh, which is certainly something I, I, I would like to compel you to think about using in your practice uh, and getting policies in place for. Um, so preoperative BNP, this is not really a new study. It's from 2011. Uh, and this was the first to really show um, how abnormal elevated BNPs before surgery correlated with adverse cardiac events after surgery. And you can see here, if you've got your um, below screening um, and optimal diagnostic, diagnostic being what cardiologists use to diagnose heart failure, definitely have a risk if compared to someone whose BNP was normal, 6.5 compared to 1.2. But the higher you get on that pre-op BNP, the higher the risk of MACE is. And just like the higher troponins are postoperatively, the higher your risk of MACE, the higher your pre-op BNPs are, the higher your risk of MACE so now we've got a preoperative screening tool that performs well in these validation studies that we can use so that we don't have to rely so much on our clinical gestalt. We do not have to ask people about their sex lives. So there's some innovative solutions that I'll just kind of um, go through uh, relatively quickly. Um, so in lower resource places, um, and for instance, Brazil is one of the pioneers in this, they cannot do BNP screening in everyone. We can they can't. Um, and uh, so they developed this thing called Xcare, which is they do a clinical assessment. Like we're saying that, you know, that you guys are saying some of you do a clinical assessment. Um, and if you score high or very high, then you qualify for this high risk stream and you get your troponins monitored postoperatively and you um, get better handover, better vigilance. Um, just, I mean, and what that ends up being is better care, right? And that's what we're really talking about here is the better care you get when we watch you closer. Um, and what this study found was that when you do your clinical gestalt and weed down to the high risk group, 45% of these patients have MINS, troponin elevation, compared to the 8% in all comers. And even in the troponin positive group, regardless of the fact they'd already been seen as high risk, in the high-risk group who had troponin rise versus the high-risk group who didn't have troponin rise, that troponin rise group still had increased mortality, increased ICU admission, and increased complications. So this troponin rise is telling us something. It's worthwhile comparing the guidelines to that, that kind of guide our practice or, or certainly should guide our practice. Um, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society um, perioperative guidelines um, from 2017. It's a simple, it's a quick read. It's an easy read. It's really the foundation of a lot of um, our men's policy that's in place in Canada right now. 
Um, and it recommends using the, um, the RCRI to kind of begin guiding your risk assessment and actually to determine if you need a BNP or not for, pa for patients. There's no explicit recommendation of how to assess functional capacity because we kind of heard that it's not really useful. Do recommend um, using BNP in selected patients. And I'll show you what the, what the flow chart for that looks like, um, something you can employ your own center. And then the recommended post-operative biomarker is troponin for say two to three days, each day, two to three days post-operatively. I'm hoping that this all sounds somewhat familiar to you. Um, and then contrast that with what we see, for instance, in Europe. Um, the main difference being that the European guidelines, guidelines from 2022 say that we should do a pre-op troponin and look at the delta, the difference between the pre-op and the post-op troponin to guide our MINS monitoring escalation. And there's lots of, there's lots of evidence for that as well. Um, and the American guidelines, um, so I, I have highlighted here that this is actually an, a statement from the American Heart Association. The guidelines are old from the states. And in fact, they don't even have cardiac biomarkers in them at all because they're from, they're officially from 2014. Um, but the um, the American guidelines are, are quite similar to what ours would be, with the exception that they mentioned using the DASI to um, gauge functional capacity. Um, and they don't have an explicit flow chart in the way that our CCS guidelines do, which I think is really useful because, again, it takes the guesswork out of it for you, for busy people on the front lines doing the work. So it's just a moment to focus a little bit more in on our guidelines. Um, so uh, a, a kind of a few notes. So we're trying to keep everything simple and practical. So the RCRI, it was simple and predictive and you actually make it better by adding BNP to it. Um, and a positive BNP preoperatively takes your risk from, if your BNP was negative of um, uh, having uh, your death or MI at 30 days, um, if your risk, if your BNP was negative from like 5%, if your BNP is positive, it goes up four times that to over 20%. So that's why BNP is adding something to our, um, to our RCRI preoperatively. A slight note about non-invasive preoperative testing. I'm sure we're all getting a lot better at this now, but only it's only ordered when indicated for symptoms or associated with non-perioperative related guidelines. Um, and when the results of the testing is going to actually change any kind of management, or of course, when surgery is elective. Um, you don't need to worry about routine echoes, DOBs, um, dopamine stress, stress echoes, sorry, um, angios, and you, you don't need to delay urgent surgery. Um, and the CCS guidelines are really empowering for that. So strongly recommend you read that and, and you get your learners to read those that, that as well. Um, this is the flow chart um, that guides our preoperative risk stratification from the CCS guidelines. So you take your all comers and it's for anyone over 45 years or younger if they have known cardiac disease. Um, and then you decide, is this elective surgery or is it emergency surgery? If it's emergency surgery, just go. There's no, there's no BNPs. There's no risk assessment. That, that's, not a, that's not a thing. But for elective surgery, now we're talking. So then you get into this incorporation of the RCRI into your risk stratification, um, and it helps guide who and who you are not going to take BNP testing in. So this is directly from the guidelines. Um, if they're over 65, they get BNP. If their um, RCRI is greater than one, they get BNP. Or if they're 45 to 64 and they've got significant cardiovascular disease, they get a BNP. And all of this comes from data pulled from the vision studies um, and showing who is the highest risk of MACE. And then we see if you get your positive BNP, those patients are the ones that get the troponins measured postoperatively. If you get your negative BNP, then you don't measure troponins routinely, and you decide based on the intraoperative course, the postoperative course, what you need to do for those patients. It would be standard recommendation from these guidelines that if you have a patient come in who would have qualified for a BNP but did not get one for whatever reason, that you would follow them with their troponins postoperatively. As I mentioned, 
the H the um, American guidelines are older and they don't include biomarkers, so they're not super useful in this discussion. Um, but the statement certainly includes your um, cardiac biomarker biomarkers, including BNP and troponin, in the exact same way that it's recommended to use in the Canadian guidelines. And then there's a bit more of a comment here about the management, which I will go into later, um, because a lot of this stuff has come out since 2017. So the Canadian guidelines don't incorporate the management into it as much as this AHA statement. And I think that's the real value of the AHA statement. And then the European guidelines, I mean, they look a little funny. Um, so I like to put it up. But the, um, the, the main thing to notice from this um, and to highlight is that they have a few different ways of, um, of designating, uh, the nomenclature is a little different. So they just call surgery, they say that NCS, which is your non-cardiac surgery. Um, <clears throat> and then they say PMI is your post, your post-operative myocardial injury instead of MINS. Long and short of it is they use the delta between the pre-op and the post-op troponin to guide their, um, their MINS monitoring and their MINS escalation. So the management of MINS, and I think this is the real important piece that is new and more provocative is because like, why should you do anything? Because for a long time after the Canadian guidelines came out, there's nothing you could do. You just monitored for it and then referred to GIM in the best case scenario um, to see if there was anything to be optimized. But we didn't really know what to do um, with, with this. But, but we do now. And I think that's why it's important to kind of get this PSA out and have this conversation. Um, <clears throat> so alluded to in the American statement was um, that there actually are things that you should do. And, and I would kind of just direct you down to the orange side, not the red side of this, because the red side is they're having an ACS. They got a plaque rupture. They need you to, to get interventional cardiology and cardiology involved and stuff. But the orange side is the... Um, is the uh, uh, type two issue. I'm just getting unstable internet signal on my end. So someone tell me if you can't hear me at all. Um, and um, this is, did you lose me for a second? No, but everything's great. Oh, good. oh great, okay, good. Um, perfect. So the orange side is your, um, is your type two, your supply demand mismatch that we, that, as I mentioned before, kind of derives 70 to 80% of our mins, our myocardial injury. And this is the one where we've got in the last five years has really brought on a lot more evidence for what we should be doing. So we, we have some evidence for antithrombotic therapy, it's blood thinners, um, anticoagulants. We've got evidence for statin therapy. We've got evidence for other cardiac medications that are even newer since this guideline was, or this statement was put out. Um, only, only, as I mentioned, do your non-invasive cardiac testing um, in isolation, it, it, like if you think it's going to alter care and not just because an isolated troponin elevation. So MINS in and of itself isn't going to result in death, but it's a marker of high risk of mortality in the short and the long term. And I hope I've convinced you of that um, because can argue about a lot of things with this, but the, the data is, is just true. And it's some of the best data we have in all of anesthesiology. And, and there used to be a lot of skepticism about this, and I, I'm not sure where it falls uh, in your group or not, um, but um, can't really argue with the, the data and the epidemiology that I'm presenting. And certainly you can decide for yourself how you're going to use that data though. Um, so what we need to do is use a standard cardiac uh, medications that we would use on any patient who presented with an acute coronary syndrome to reduce these patients' risk in the long term. So this is definitely not rocket science. This is aspirin, statins, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, um, and, uh, and ARPs. So all the stuff that is going to reduce your risk if you came in um, presenting with unstable angina or an MI is going to reduce your risk of the same if you present with MINS. And that's a big highlight from this section. I really want to really want you to take away. Uh, a huge part of our data come, came from an Alberta study, and it was a retrospective study on sixty thousand patients um, who underwent non cardiac surgery after people had begun to start these troponin draws. And so, about twenty percent of these sixty thousand patients had troponin draws, so a pretty high number. Um, and uh, five percent who had troponin draws had an elevated troponin. So these are the at-risk patients. These are the patients who 
positive MIMS. So of those patients, we're going to call 2,700 patients, at the six-month follow-up, what this Alberta study found was that 12% had been started on a new beta blocker. And those 12% of people had a 50% less ch chance of developing acute coronary syndrome and heart failure. Same goes for the 5% who were started on ACE inhibitors and who were started on and who were started on statins. Um, reduced risk of acute coronary syndrome and heart failure if they had this started newly after suffering their MIMS, which I really don't think a lot of people are aware of. And certainly I think should change our impression of there's nothing we can do about an elevated troponin. I mean, clearly we, we should, we need to be treating them like the cardiac risk factor patients they are. A more provocative topic is uh, anticoagulation uh, after MIMS. And um, this is a study called the MANAGE trial. It's done over two years um, by a similar group who completed the vision trial. Um, and because uh, it's kind of, you know, there there is some rationale uh, to thinking that anticoagulation um, would be a benefit uh, to improve uh to improve um, outcomes in, uh, in, ele in elevated um, troponin after surgery, probably mostly driven by that 20 to 30% group who are suffering um, coronary syndromes, plaque rupture, as opposed to the supply demand group. Um, so this trial was started. So just randomized people who had elevated MINS to getting dipigotran, uh, Pradaxa, uh, twice a day uh, to placebo and routine care. <clears throat> uh, and um, they looked at all the outcomes you'd want to look at in terms of the vascular mortality, MIs, uh, ischemic strokes, um, thr arterial thrombosis, and uh, venous thrombosis. And they also looked at important safety outcomes like life-threatening, major incredible or organ bleeding. It was a well-done study. Um, the, the groups are identical. And what they found was that like, yeah, the dibigatran actually, the anticoagulation actually did um, reduce the risk of your composite vascular outcomes um, compared to uh, your placebo, compared to your standard of care. Um, it's a maybe not a super compelling percentage difference compared to how nice that Kaplan-Meier looks. Um, your risk of major vascular comp complications is 11% in the, in the uh, Pradaxa group compared to 15% in the placebo group. Maybe that's you don't feel like that's enough to make it worth um, the the anticoagulation for for that period of time, um, but safe, no increased incidence of any kind of major bleeding, um, but certainly some inc increased incidence of some of the minor bleeding, um, so non significant lower GI minor bleeds and then dyspepsia um, with the in the dibigatran group. So you're you're kind of left wondering. Um, and then you yeah, ne necessarily have to wonder about the cost of it. And uh, interestingly, when they did the economic analysis, adding the uh, the bigotran cost to the, the the intervention group did not increase the cost at all. Cost neutral. Um, so the findings technically support the use of um, Pradaxa and MINS, the bigotran and MINS, and we'll extrapolate that probably to um, the other DOACs. But what practically I think everyone is doing is that... Um, using that only in a subsection of men's patients who really seem to, to be characterized more by that thrombotic group, that plaque rupture group, as opposed to the supply demand group. So some conclusions, um, men. So this is the men, our men's summary slide. So remember that it happens. This is, is happening in 8% of non-cardiac surgery, and it's not really debatable. These are just, this is data from 15,000 patient studies prospectively. You will miss it, MINS, if you are not following troponins, because it's largely 85 to 90% asymptomatic. Probably more importantly, you will miss MIs. Um, you'll miss about 50% of MIs, and we see that from both the vision and the poise trials. Just having troponin elevation after surgery, this confers a poor prognosis because we know that over 15% of these patients will go on to have major vascular complications. 
And then most compellingly, I think in now is that we can do something about it. Um, we can manage it at low cost and with reasonable evidence. Um, and that evidence mounts every day with our statins, our ACE inhibitors, um, our aspirin, beta blockers, and then in select patients where you think it might be that 20 to 30% thrombotic plaque rupture um, path, uh, DOACs, such as dabigatran. And your preoperative risk assessment, this is where BNP comes into play. So it has value. It matters. It matters to patients. It should matter to you. And it matters to healthcare in general because someone has to bring all these pieces together. And it, it is often us who does that. Um, BNP is the best, or troponin, if you're in Europe, BNP is the best and the easiest. It makes your job easier. You don't have to ask a bunch of awkward questions to people. You can do your BNP. Um, and really, I think that's what it's about is, is working smarter, not harder, not doing the things that don't add value, but do doing the things that do add value. For instance, having a nice, informed, well-paced consent discussion with patients. Um, your DASI, your Duke Activity Status Index, and your RCRI, Revised Cardiac Risk Index, are endorsed by guidelines across the world and are useful they do help guide you in what you're doing. Um, and then your preoperative BNP, it can help you focus on patients who are more likely to have postoperative complications um, and know who to give that attention to. So how to do this at your institution, it needs to be a team approach. You need buy-in from your champions, from anesthesia, medicine, cardiology, surgery, and then your allied health, your pharmacy, your lab, and your nursing. At our institution, we have a whole program where, um, wherein we have nursing directives that are built right into the pre-op nursing testing that pulled directly from our the CCS guidelines. So they order BNP and the anesthesiologist and pre-op clinic don't even have to think about it. You just get the results that can then guide your discussions. Um, and we have a post-op men's uh, order set that all the surgical residents get orientated to super easy to fill out. And again, it adheres directly to the recommendations from the CCS guidelines. Um, and often we try and incorporate a positive BNP um, in the safety check so that it kind of twigs everyone like, this is a patient who we didn't think we need to worry about, but like they had a positive BNP and you know we need to keep an eye on them and we're gonna do men's monitoring because of that. And then what you need is a policy in place and, and allies in medicine and cardiology to assist you with that assessment of risk reduction. This doesn't all have to be just you, the anesthesiologist. Um, so in our center, our policy is that if it's just a troponin elevation in the absence of ECG changes or any other cardiac concern, then it's a referral um, to um, general internal medicine for risk reduction strategies like statins, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors. And if there's any kind of cardiac features, ECG changes, anything like that, and a troponin elevation, of course, we refer to cardiology um, for intervention for probable MACE. So going back to both of our patients, we have a model patient who looks amazing and like has to be admitted for her bilateral um, knee arthroplasty, but would rather just go home. And then we've got our like train wreck vascular patient. So in our center, they both get BNPs because this is, you know, like we we call the FEMPOP elective surgery, but really it probably falls into that semi-elective piece where you still have time to do the BNP. So therefore you do do it. Um, and um, we, we get our results. And, you know, interestingly in um, our, our lady, uh, we, our BNP is 213. So she actually qualifies for men's monitoring. Okay. And in our fellow, his BNP is 30 and he does not qualify for men's monitoring. However, in the rest of his appointment, his hemoglobin A1C was 11.6. Um, he was wheezing and not on appropriate like puffer therapy and you still don't feel great about him. So having a negative or normal BNP as opposed to an elevated BNP it doesn't have to change anything about your good clinical gestalt that this person is high risk and has things need to be optimized. That patient still should see GIM before surgery, hopefully, certainly, certainly post-operatively to help to 
smooth and adjust and intervene on all those items that um that I I just mentioned. And your your lady, I mean, she'll probably be fine still, but she needs bins monitoring. And don't you owe it to her to do that to make sure that she's okay, given that she's done such a good job taking care of herself. And she'd probably be delighted to know that she could do something simple to reduce her risk of um, MIs and heart failure in the future. This is an example of our um, nursing directive. Number 10 item there is the BNP. And this is pulled directly from the guidelines. And this is how our nurses know who to order BNP for. Um, and this is an example of our um, order set that we've post-operatively for MINS monitoring. It's just one page, very simple to do. Um, it has the RSAI built right in there. It's just a few tick boxes. And then the nurses know to order a, a PACU ECG. And um, the surgeon, the nurses on the ward know to take the post-operative troponins. And then when we talk about it in the safety check, the, the uh, surgical residents know that this is a patient they're going to have to like check up on. And they'll see the, the blood work regardless. And on a personal note, to do that conversion study that I talked about, the NT pro BNP to BNP conversion formula, um, we had to follow for two months the 430 patients we saw in the in the pre-op clinic in that in that two month window. And these are patients who are coming in for elective cases who had time to be optimized. And I, again, I'll say elective, and it will of course include these fem pops who are questionably elective. Um, but three percent of them had mins. Um, two of them, you know, 13 people had this troponin elevation who hopefully were all started on new cardioprotective medication. Two had an MI that they needed, that they needed intervention for. Someone had a stroke. We had some cardiac arrest that luckily people survived. Heart failure, a bunch of people had new AFib, a bunch of people had pneumonia. And we had four people die, two non-vascular and two vascular deaths. And maybe it's, not compelling when it's not patients that were from your center that were seen in your clinic over two months. But I felt very much that it was emphasized how little I know about how my patients are doing when I saw these numbers and, um, <clears throat> and follows them to make sure that nothing's happened. We've had great um, patient satisfaction and great results with that. And, um, and then the prehabilitation studies that we're working on, um, we're working on getting a program in place to work on trimodal prehabilitation, which is working with patients at least four weeks before surgery on their exercise, nutrition, and mindfulness to improve their baseline function before they even come in for surgery. And that way, even though we know they're going to lose a bit of ground because surgery is hard on the body and it's stressful and th they, they lose some ground, we're going to get them back up faster to where they were if they start higher in the first place. So these things are happening all over the country, all over the world, and I, I think are super exciting. You've been listening to Airway Breathing Conversation, a podcast hosted and presented by the anesthesiology residents at the University of Saskatchewan. Please note that while this podcast is run by healthcare professionals, it is intended for educational and entertainment purposes only. We are very thankful to our guests for taking the time to share their wisdom with us this episode, and a very special thanks to you, our listeners, for tuning in. Don't forget to follow us and our associated USASC Anesthesia accounts on social media. You can find all our social media links on our Linktree page at linktr.ee slash abc underscore podcast. You can also find the department's social media links on their Linktree page at linktr.ee slash usask underscore anesthesia. We'll see you next episode, but until then, stay calm, take a breath, and always remember your ABCs.